Well, welcome. I'm so glad you all are here um, in the Maine Charitable Mechanics Association Library, one of the best rooms downtown. Um, we're here for the third installment in the Makers at the Hall series, showcasing makers talking together about what it is to make things in Portland. Um, and this is a series of lectures ongoing, the last Wednesday in every month. So next month, we're going to have Doug Green speaking. The summer is TBD. We're looking to have a social event um, for makers in July, a panel discussion in August. So we've got a lot up and coming. The series is um, generously supported by the Warren Memorial Foundation, so thank you to them for that. And tonight, we have Kate Anker with us from Running With Scissors. And I'm going to hand over to Kate to give us an idea of who she is, what she's done, and then we'll move from there. She and I will chit chat and then bring you all in. Great. Well, Kate, thank who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Today. Um, well, thank you for having me. I'm really um, uh, not only pleased to be speaking here, but that you, this is a, um, a series that you're doing. I think it's really important and it's really interesting in our community um, to bring light to makers of all variety. and. Um, share it with, uh, with everyone. Um, so I've always um, been a maker, I guess. Um, you know, maker of mud pies when I was a kid, <laughs> maker of great, fantastic messes in my bedroom as a child. Um, and, um, and I grew up with makers. I grew up in the Midwest. Um, my father was a carpenter, my mother was a weaver, and there were just always artists and makers and um, I've kind of recently, um, but they never uh, described themselves as such, so I kind of started thinking about them as farmer artists. They were just, it was just something that they, they did and it was always a part of their life and I didn't realize that until of course I went away um, and um, had some distance to um, what a gift that was to be around. Um, I didn't follow any kind of linear path like most um, makers, although I'm always astonished by people who do find that linear path and just go for it. Um, very um, awestruck by those people who can do that. Um, I always knew I would be doing artwork um, in some form in my life, so I went to school. Um, however, I also love science, so I went to school pre-med thinking, oh, art will just be my side gig. Um, and by about sophomore year, I fully switched to art and Asian studies, studied Japanese and um, printmaking and ceramics and um, spent some time abroad and really got some fantastic experience that way. But again, just kind of always circling this path of making, never really gravitating to one uh, medium. And um, worked as an apprentice after college, so I had the this was a really um, a traditional Japanese apprenticeship, even though it happened in the Midwest. Um, the man I worked for had um, studied in Japan and became a master potter, so we did everything, you know, working our way up. Um, we were apprentice one, apprentice two, apprentice three, and everything was very hierarchical and, and, and like that. Um, and <coughs> then I came to Maine actually for a internship in bookbinding. Um, I, again, went another route after ceramics and um, explored that for a while. Fully intended to just spend three months out here, but darn, it's just so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, my parents, after, you know, 17 years, keep saying, so you're probably not moving back. <laughs> like, I am now married with two children, and both of us have um, entrepreneurial jobs here in Maine, so yeah, mom and dad, if you're watching, I'm not coming back. <laughs> um, and, um, and then I also, um, when I moved out here, I, I um, kind of put the ceramics aside and was um, doing bookbinding and printmaking, and so I opened up a um, restoration bookbinding and letterpress business that I ran for five years um, out of the State Theatre building and um, a couple other studios in Portland and in South Portland. 
had the experience of moving a letterpress and um, 20 cases of lead type around way more than any of my friends uh, want to remember or think about. And, um, and then after five years, um, my husband and I had uh, purchased a, an apartment building to live in and we rehabbed it floor by floor, which was also another intensive learning lesson um, as a maker of a different sort. Um, and then um, we, we ended up having to sell the business, um, had, some, uh, had my first child, and um, found myself all of a sudden as an artist and a maker without a home. So I stumbled upon Running With Scissors Studios and um, to rent time on their printing press and started working there. Um, that was 2006, so about 10 years ago and um, worked very happily in two different places that they had their space. And then um, about f uh, in June, it'll be five years, that um, the owners, the founders came to me and um, asked if I'd be interested in buying the business. So never thought that I would be. Um, but again, it's not that linear path. It was a whole lot of circling and wiggling and everything. Um, but it was this aha moment of the combination of so many different paths in my life um, coming together. And so that's when I became the owner and director of Running With Scissors, um, which is <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was you would segue <laughs> into, um, so Running With Scissors is um, now a 13-year-old um, artist studio organization. Um, that uh, was started by three women who met during art school at um, a couple different schools, USM and uh, Mecca. And they left school realizing they were missing um, three really important elements, community, space, and equipment. And um, so they decided to do something pretty crazy and made this group. Um, and it's grown ever since then, and um, we are now in our third and hopefully final building. Um, we moved about three years ago, and we were about 15 artists when I bought the business in 2011. 2000, yeah, 11. <laughs> and um, we're now 58 artists. Um, so we're, um, we're really, really excited, and I think as we'll be discussing, it, it gives a lot, of, um, a lot of testament to the, the growth and the strength of the creative community here in Portland and, and around. So um, that's kind of what Running With Scissors is um, in a nutshell. Um, but uh, yeah, do yeah. we have... I sure do. <laughs> Great. Come on in. Find a seat. We're happy to have more people joining our conversation. Make us awesome. comfortable. So you talked a little bit right at the beginning about how mm -hmm. you you were a maker from little. Yeah. And I think most of us can sympathize with that for sure, being a maker as a, a little person. Mm -hmm. and, but you had the extra fortune to have adult makers around you. And now you're in a building with 58, mm -hmm. and now you use the word artists, but they're making things. Yeah. And so we've had conversations, you and I, about what that word is. This is a big buzzword right now, this word maker. Mm -hmm. um, what does that word mean for you like, today, right yeah. now? And who are, who are the makers of Portland in your experience? Yeah, I think... Um I think maker is something that's having a bit of a, um, a resurgence. Um, I looked it up in the dictionary today just as I was trying to explain to my children you know, what a maker is. Um, and they, of course, kept asking, well, why is it this? Well, why is it that? And, you know, it's like, oh, I better go to the dictionary because you keep asking. Um, and it was really interesting to see the traditional sense was a person or a company or an entity that makes something. I thought, well, that's pretty vague, <laughs> you know. That's um, and then the urban definition was um, more in line with where my feelings are. Um, it was a person, a person who has passion about 
creating something with their hands. And then it said it was also tied to um, kind of the maker movement, which is also incorporates um, sharing of ideas, sharing of um, knowledge and figuring out ways together to do it, um, whatever it is you want to do. Um, the way I interpret that is also in a fairly broad sense. Um, you know, I think that um, I enjoy visualizing, you know, um, culinary makers and um, and more industrial makers, welders and woodworkers, and but then I also, you know, painters um, and printmakers. So again, it's I think for me, it's someone who is um, passionately creating something with their hands. And in today's culture, I think it also involves a lot of community around it, either sharing of ideas or sharing of work. Um, I think that I was thinking about this and I was trying to explain that I also think about it a little bit um, like a square and a rectangle um, for the terms artist and maker. And that, you know, I said, well, I feel like an artist is a maker, but is a maker an artist? And where does that come in to play? Um, similarly, you know, not all. Um, <laughs> it's, I'm going to get it wrong because I'm not, I'm not a mathematician. Um, cause the, yeah, not all rectangles are squares, but all squares are rectangles. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Dad. Um, so I think that, I think it's a, a term that has evolving me, um, means for me, uh, meaning for me. And um, I think I find that it does for a lot of even the makers that I talk to. And, um, I think there are maybe levels of makers as far as their intent on what they, they do with what they're making. Um, and I think that that's really fascinating. And like any kind of movement, I think that terminology and that um, layering kind of evolves and um, it kind of has to learn who it is and what it is and you know so I think that that is I think we're in an interesting time and um, so I yeah that's yeah and that touches <coughs> so many like deep like questions with a really long history yeah I'm reminded hearing you talk of the way that the arts and the crafts have mm -hmm. had a similar is every craftsman an artist is every right. artist a craftsman and I feel yeah. like you know those are words that we're having that same you know, mm -hmm. doing the same dance um, yep. over time, and and to the the word mechanics in this room in this right. building, yeah, um, that word too was a really broad um, word, which I realize is in that little play within a play in Midsummer Night's Dream. The rude mechanicals come out <laughs> to make their play, and they're yeah. all you know a tinker and a weaver. Right, that's who they are too. Yeah. So so this yeah. is an old an old question. Yes. Renewed for our time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's the debate of the arts and crafts from the 60s and, you know, 50s coming kind of back around. And I, mm -hmm. I think that any time you have discussion about that, it, um, well, one, it indicates that people are really interested in that. They're interested in making. They're interested in what we do with our hands and our creative expression. And I think, um, you know, discussion and even disagreement, because I know there are a lot of people who will disagree and say, well, no, it really has more to do with technology and, you know, that kind of, the interplay possibly of technology and fine art. And, you know, I think, bring it on, let's have those discussions. Yes, let's talk. <laughs> let's, we're yeah, because it means yeah. that we're actually thinking about it and um, mm -hmm. exploring. And then usually when you do those things, growth happens. So, you know, that is what excites me about a lot about the maker movement, and um, so yeah. Nate, and in Portland, who who what are what are makers doing in your estimation here in Portland? Yeah. You, you know there are communities all over the place, but yeah, this is ours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I think um, I think we have a really interesting um, and diverse group of makers, right? We have, um, you know, we have a blacksmith, a traditional blacksmith, and we have um, groups like um, Open Bench Project doing really fantastic 
um, you know, more industrial, hands-on educational things. Um, we have also um, great um, film and video happening and, mm -hmm. you know, this um, kind of collaborative co-working um, happenings in so many. Uh, culinary is really, obviously, we're in Portland. Um, it's um, to all of our benefits that we have all these fantastic, <laughs> you know, culinary makers. Um, but I, I think that it's even more. I think, um, you know, I've been approached by people to, they can they build a tiny house in our parking lot? Um, you know, with a tool library, we have the Resilience Hub, we have, and they're all making things, um, rocket, um, they call them rocket chimneys. I oh remember, yes. have you seen the these? Yeah, the rocket stoves. Yes. They're amazing. They're amazing. And yeah, and fantastic. <laughs> and, um, you know, I uh, just down the street from us, I mean, if you just look at um, East Bayside as a little microcosm of the greater community of Portland, you know, we have weavers and s people sewing, you know, there's a slow clothing uh, movement along mm -hmm. with a slow food movement and um, a gathering of stitches, um, whole, having these great um, workshops on how to make your own patterns again. And, you know, I mean, my mother made all of our clothes when I was little and, you know, I didn't think anything of it until later and I thought, I have no idea how to make my own underwear. This is fascinating. <laughs> Why would I ever do that? But that's incredible that you did. Thank you. Um, so I think, I think we have um, all kinds of makers and I think it's uh, a really rich culture. So I mean, I could name so many. There are some makers that I would like to see more of. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love to see um, glass blowers and sculptors more coming in um, those take a lot more infrastructure so they're a little bit harder to um, infuse into a community on that kind of more DIY scale um, but um, I feel like again as all this attention and interest is happening those bigger um, communal uh, things infrastructure can also be born so Neat. So making so many glass making. makers out there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's do it. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. And I feel like that's an interesting comment. How you know we're getting critical mass of other kinds of makers mm -hmm. who aren't blowing glass, mm -hmm. but the glass blowers might want to come and join the party. Right. Um, it's and a great party. It's a great party. <laughs> yes. And so uh, we were talking earlier too about. Um, how did you say it just a, a minute ago about the sort of levels at which people are involved mm. in making? And so yeah. not everybody is making their living, making their right. whatever they make. Not every painter is making a living as a painter. Right. Not every everybody, not everyone who cooks, even cooks very well, is making their living right. um, cooking. Mm -hmm. But some people <coughs> are, and some people are are wanting to and mm -hmm. trying to yeah and I'd love to hear what you think that's like for mm -hmm. people in Portland who are trying to take it to that level to to make a living as makers and what yeah. what challenges people face how does that how does that go yeah um, I think that like any small business there are a lot of challenges obviously but I think that the um, the artist the maker the creator of um, you know, a small business uh, with a product, it's, um, it's, uh, I think it's really challenging here. I think we have a lot of interest, we have a lot of support, we have, you know, these people, um, this community that's really interested in the handmade, in um, what people are making, but there also reaches a little bit of a level of critical mass where um, I think you know, there, there's just so many people who are maybe selling their items and only so many people here in our community. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, they can buy them. So I think it's, uh, there are some challenges, challenges there. Um, but I constantly kind of trying to talk to people about if we switch 10% of our purchasing like we do, like we have for um, local farming, and local agriculture to local locally made products um, everywhere from, you know, finding someone in Maine to, or in Portland to, um, 
you know, take your your wedding photos or make your dishes or your clothing or, you know, your artwork for your walls. Um, it really, all that money just funnels right back into our, our central community. So I think that there are some challenges of, of education and just getting, you know, continually getting the word out that this is a wonderful thing, but we also need to support that wonderful thing or it will kind of go away. Um, it won't be sustainable. Um, and then I know you and I have also talked about um, the challenge of having all these makers selling in a similar format online or in local fairs. Um, sometimes the person who is trying to make a living at it is at a table or a booth next to someone who, um, who doesn't need to be making a living or isn't really the focus. And the person who's really trying to make a living is pricing their work at a level that um, you know, they've worked out all the cost of goods and their overhead and they're really trying to um, price their work accordingly. And the other person um, might not have that same focus and therefore the competition is really, um, is tipped. The kind of the economic bar is a little wonky at times. And I know that's something that our artists struggle with a lot is just how do you, you know, as we said, it's one thing to compete with, um, items made maybe out of the country um, that are at a lower price, but when you're looking at two locally handmade items and one is a fraction of the price of the other and they're both equally well made, mm -hmm. how does that, um, how can we level the playing field a little bit? Um, and, you know, that's something that we try to work on and discuss in our community um, of makers, um, but it's also kind of a again, a bit of that education for the, the greater community. So I think that's a struggle. I think, um, obviously, um, being that often one person show of the designer, maker, bookkeeper, you know, 17 hat wear is, is, a, real, is a real struggle. And um, the scale at which um, you know, a lot of makers can move is very slow. It isn't, um, you know, like um, the startup community, there's a lot of buzz with startups, and, um, but they're really interested in rapid growth and scalability, whereas someone who can throw 100 mugs in a, a week, you know, they might not be able to throw any faster than that, <laughs> and, um, or they might be able to throw slightly faster, but there's a limit to how quickly they can scale and how, you know, what kind of room there is for them to grow. So I think that growth is a lot slower and economic times can shift very quickly and, and um, just the, the culture and the way um, our technology works. Um, I mean, when I had my business many years ago, um, 10, 12 years ago, um, you know, it, there weren't all these internet platforms that I could sell on. So it was really challenging to meet my customers in a way that's much different now and in five years, I'm sure there will be things that we have no idea even, you know, will exist for people to have for sale platforms and marketing and, you know, all these things. You'll just have a hologram where you can <laughs> hand it right over to your client and um, <clears throat> whatever. But um, I think that, you know, technology is a big thing for someone who does a traditional craft trying to keep up also to be, you know, learn HTML or coding or whatever to just be able to meet the demand of the culture, um, the rapid growth of that part of the business is um, not a skill set that everybody has, that they can have that many different hats that they can wear well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Wow, so it sounds like, if I've heard you right, and you'll correct me if I go astray. <laughs> sure. Um, but it sounds like, <coughs> like someone who really loves throwing pots mm -hmm. and wants to make a living throwing pots has all sorts of, like, if I, it sounds like there are like two main things. Like, one is having to do everything, mm -hmm. which is problematic. Yeah. Um, and I think it's faced by <laughs> any artist, like, a lot of people face those, mm -hmm. those issues being their own selves. But this issue of scale mm -hmm. seems also really 
fascinating. Yeah. Because um, there's the, the personal scalability, and many people choose making pots because they mm -hmm. don't want to throw more than 100 mugs in a day. Right. That is, the, that is the human limit, or right. whatever it is. Right, right. I don't know. I'm not, not going to no, say that's either. the limit, because I, I will be called out by all my ceramic artists. Why did you say that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so the scale of production is one thing, but mm -hmm. then this technological thing, I think it yeah. bumps up against what, we, what you were saying earlier about you know, local, spending your dollars locally mm -hmm. in a really interesting way, doesn't it? Because on the one hand, being able to sell online helps you by broadening your market base. So it's, right. it's really easy to scale up your market base, yeah. at least technically. Right. Um, but that also puts you in an interesting place in your local <laughs> community. And as a local, right. you know, from here in Portland, Maine, if I can see all of the letterpress printers in all of the U.S., mm -hmm. then suddenly... Right. You're competing with the whole of America, right. yep. um, who are maybe, yeah, which is just, gosh, that might be a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> it is a fast-growing trend. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it is. And I think that that's, um, that concept of, of growing, I mean, you know, if you have a business, you want it to grow and do well and, you know, mm -hmm either sustain itself, hopefully, or, um, or really um, thrive. And I think there's all kinds, along the way, there's all kinds of um, hurdles that, you know, you kind of start very locally and, you know, you may reach that broader community very quickly. And I think that is one of the, you know, fascinating things with our um, technological advances that we can um, and, uh, and many people here um, do that, you know, they, they live and work here. The quality of life is something that, um, I mean, you know, we all cherish. It's what kept me here. Um, but um, making that livelihood based on this direct community for a lot of people might be very difficult. So mm -hmm. um, you have to kind of, maybe not with every everything, but choose, do I stay in you know, focus locally, do I try and reach a broader uh, base, mm -hmm. how again does that um, relate particularly if you start locally and purport yourself to be, you know, local. The, certain people don't have issues with it and, and sometimes the business does. It really is, um, it can be a tricky situation for, for locals, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the many interesting dances we're all having yeah. to do right now, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. 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 And so speaking of, like, how can how can we support people who are like doing that crazy mm -hmm. thing, like taking that big <laughs> risk and trying and and trying to put themselves out there yeah. and and make their living um, on their craft? How can we how can we help? Yeah. Should we help? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that um, it's, it's being, well, first of all, just being aware, you know, that there are all of these um, various outlets for um, purchasing, right? I mean, if we're consume, looking at ourselves as consumers of products, of services, um, to really try to put into practice looking very close um, to home first before jumping to um, the internet to just find the easiest thing that might be, you know, in California or New York or wherever, but um, taking maybe a little bit more effort to just say, I wonder if I could get a whole set of dishes for my wedding locally made. Yes, you can. I just want to <laughs> say, you can, and they're beautiful and wonderful. You can, you know, your clothing, there's so many things that you can um, get just, you know, steps away from your home. And I think if we even just could put into practice um, doing just, just a little bit more and making um, other people, your friends and coworkers aware that you're doing it, I think then, you know, just spreading the word that, hey, there are a lot of people here and we may know about them, but it's one thing to know about and another thing to actually go and seek them out and um, purchase their work. And it's, it's actually interesting. I have some very good friends who come to our big um, open studios, which are in the spring and the winter, <laughs> little plug, um, around Mother's Day and, and uh, the seasonal holidays in the winter, um, 
and they say, well, I'm saving up, you know, to come to your two big events so I can get, you know, the work from these artists that I love. And I said, that's fantastic, that's great, but did you know you can actually call them up anytime you want <laughs> and, like, hang out in their studio and talk to them directly and, you know, have that same um, experience of getting it directly from the, from the maker um, anytime you want. And it's, you know, it's just that communicating and that educating and I think if we all just keep talking about it and keep encouraging each other to consider it and to kind of get it into our habit, into our practice um, of our, you know, just kind of um, voracious consumer nature, um, we're going to consume. So if we can consume from local um, makers, then I think the, the return, it's been proven time again, is just enormous, um, you know, to the community to keep that quality of um, vitality and enrichment um, and just the economic situation. Um, you know, if I buy things from my neighbor, she can turn around and buy things from myself and my husband and, you know, it just, it comes full circle. So, it's, you know, the buy local, it's there for, it's there for a reason, it works. For sure. And so. it's nimble too, because I remember, the, what was it, I had a, I had a, a hook situation. There was an <laughs> odd corner in our house. I hope it. I hope it turned what? out all right. <laughs> it sounds awful. No, but it was. A, you know, it was, it was a moment that our blacksmith could oh. have sorted out in a yeah. second. Yeah. Yeah. But because none of the IKEA solutions yes. would fit, and I thought, you know, that's the trouble. Mm -hmm. Like, it's one thing in you know, a scaling up production. Yeah. You lose a certain kind of nimbleness. Yeah. Because if I could call the blacksmith and say, "Look, there's that weird corner yep. in this house. What can you do?" He yeah. would say, "Well, you can do this or this or yeah. this, and we could talk about it and mm -hmm. do exactly what that corner needs, right. or right. get exactly your own body shape and fit, yeah. um, just so by yeah. your tailor." So I think mm -hmm. those are yeah. There's, nimbleness and yeah. um, sort of precision are advantages yeah. that come too sometimes. Oh, definitely, things. definitely. Talking straight to you. About yes. Making a thing for you. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, um, and I, you know, I think that the really wonderful thing about, you know, the more I talk to people, they say, oh, that's so great. Well, did you know there's also this person who does this? And I say, no, you know, tell me about it. And it's like, <laughs> this is fantastic, you know. So it's, it's um, it's really it can be really addictive to realize that you can you know just get these things local and there's um, there's also such an, a, a richness that comes from being able to say you know oh I, the person who made my bag well let me tell you about her oh she's amazing and you know and the leather comes from here and I learned this about how you sew these things and you know um, just when I give a gift, I know that I can not only just give an item, I can, I can give it with this incredible story that goes along with it. And um, I think that that's something that, um, you know, we all have our, our phones and our technology and we, everyone says we're so um, becoming so separate from each other and distant because of that. I think that this maker movement is a fantastic way to um, bring us all closer and bring our stories because when we make something we make it um, from our, our our body and our person and everything that's inside of us and so then when we sell it or share it with somebody else then that's just you know co a connection that is so um, unique and strong and and it, it's powerful wow. so. that's really it's lovely. powerful it's powerful it is yeah it is. yeah so. Yeah, and now, sort of, in a way, picking up there, because mm -hmm. you've talked a lot, I feel like you've made this motion a lot, yeah. about connecting bringing it together. <laughs> bringing people together. Yeah. Um, do you want to say a little bit about where you fit? Because it seems to me that that might be one of the things you do at Running yeah. Scissors. <laughs> um, yeah, and I do it more and more often. Um, um, one of my personal and Running With Scissors missions is to elevate the, the artists that we have. The, um, and by that I mean their, their opportunity to be able to create what they want, if that's through equipment or community support or space, um, but also through connections. Um, 
we are, you know, we have this power in numbers now, which is really what I had hoped would happen. But with 58 coming together, um, it's, it's um, given us a kind of strength that's really interesting. And um, so I'm, one of the things I'm trying to do is kind of trying to take advantage of that and connect artists with um, local businesses. Um, I met with Edgecombe Potters today who are doing, we're starting to do a partnership with um, this is the second month that they're highlighting one of our artists in their stores and um, really giving an experience um, to our artists that um, you know, they maybe wouldn't have otherwise been able to, to do. Um, we're working with um, a couple other local businesses and designers um, and just making those connections. So I do a lot of introducing connection making. Um, talking with um, a wide variety of um, businesses, designers, um, and just kind of working to build that knowledge base for them that, again, they can go um, and, and meet directly with an artist and get something very specific for their business, for their um, staff, for their um, design line. Um, and it's really, um, it's really something I enjoy a lot um, because seeing that connection happen, I know that both the artists in our community and my local businessman or um, service provider has found a solution to their problem that's unique and um, more sustainable to the community. So it, it, it you know, handles things on a lot of different levels. So. Um, I do a lot of that and then just talking um, as our community internally about the business struggles, the how do we um, handle these in a creative and communal kind of way and um, so that's also a really important part of um, kind of, you know, all of us rising up together and we're all at different levels, you know, 58 people on their creative path. Um, I always say that I try to meet someone where they're at, find out where they go, they want to go, and then try and figure out, well, how do we, you know, how do I play a role in that? And sometimes it's, you know, just be here when I need you. <laughs> um, and, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's um, just the process of talking through things and, you know, um, um, introducing them to people and that I've met and kind of cultivated relationships with and everything, so. It's, um, yeah, it's fun. It sounds like one of the things you're doing is making community, aren't you? I'm making no. community. <laughs> but it's true. But it's true. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. a, it's an invisible, yeah. sometimes invisible version of making, but it's real. Yeah, it is. And I think, um, I mean, I feel extremely fortunate that, you know, I get to make community with fantastically creative people every day. So, you know, it's, it's pretty pretty awesome um, and they make it a lot easier by being being that way but there are definite you know hurdles and such um, to to work around but they're you know creative problem solving is what makers and creatives do do yeah. well so <laughs> it's what we kind of search out in a possibly masochistic way you yeah. know why do I look for the problems to solve because then I just have to solve it <laughs> you know but um, but you know thank God there's so many problems to solve so <laughs> we can we have job security forever um, right. where yeah and if it were too easy then you'd have to make a problem first yes it's true solve it, it no. is yes yep. yeah good at making problems as well that yes. I have to solve so yeah, just ask any of the artists. They will probably attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I yeah. bet. Yeah. Wow. Well, I think this might be a great moment to open it to the floor and see what you guys think, what, what questions might have come up as we've been talking. What sparks your interest? Yeah, and that's it. So uh, some, some subcategories of makers or, or communities within Portland have started Bending together and acting as a community. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the best example is the Brewers Guild, yeah. uh, which has done a lot uh, and had 
probably far more of an impact than they could independently from one another. Definitely. And uh, it, it seems like with the density of makers in Portland, there's an opportunity for the makers to come together and have yeah. a, a similar voice. And I was wondering if you might speak to that. Um, yeah, I, um, I agree. I think that, uh, you know, it's one of the reasons that when I bought Running With Scissors very quickly, you know, I realized there's, there's strength in numbers. Um, we all have similar problems that we can help each other um, with and, um, and, and to that effect, um, you know, celebrations um, that we can share and learn from from each other. Um, I think it would be very powerful to see more of a formalized um, maker artist. I know there is the artists um, union that uh, many artists um, subscribe to and are a part of. Um, I think that to some degree, you know, as I said, we're kind of in this evolving terminology of what is a maker mm -hmm. and so I think there are definitely factions of the makers that will gel together a little bit easier than kind of the really broad scope of them um, but um, I'd be really interested to see I know well this this organization the yeah they can definitely. play a role and, and bring together that big tent of makers yeah. and, and mm -hmm. doing something with that I would love to see that. I think it would be great. I, I firm believer in, in um, individuals and groups coming together and, and ways to you know, lift all boats. And um, so if that happens, you know, let us know. Talk to us. <laughs> well, as an honorary member, you'll be yes. part of it. Yes, yeah, right? OK, yeah. there we go. I'm, I'm there. Um, but I do think it's, um, you know, I. So when I said I purchased Running With Scissors, it sounded kind of easy, um, like it was just a natural <laughs> thing to happen. Um, but really, I'd been an artist and, and a maker in Portland for you know, many years, and I'd filled out many surveys that you know, different um, groups had, had sent out asking questions like, do we need an artist collective? Do we need studio space? Do we need, what do we need? And you know, dutifully filled out my surveys. And I kept kind of looking around for, okay, well, I've done my job and I'm waiting, you know, <laughs> when's it going to happen? Mm -hmm. And so when um, Ariet and Susie um, said they were going to sell, my first inclination also was, oh my gosh, 15 of us are going to be studio lists, you know, what are we going to do? <laughs> Who's going to come in? And again, I kept looking around going, you know, someone's going to do this, <laughs> right? <laughs> and when you look around the room, I've heard it termed, if you look around the room and you know someone's being a jerk and you can't figure out who it is, it might be you. <laughs> so I kind of had that same feeling of not being a jerk, but just um, you know I've been looking for someone else to do it, and then I realized, oh wait a minute, I actually I think I think this is me. I think I'm supposed to to take this on, and so I think that you know if that happens with um, the mechanics all, you know that. There are often, you know, we get caught up in, in realizing that we're saying something over and over again. Like, I think this would be great to have happen. I think this would be great. Don't you think it'd be great? It'd be great. <laughs> oh, maybe I'm supposed to do something about that because <laughs> I keep saying it. Um, I think there are a lot of people who probably have similar ideas and thoughts. And so also kind of going out and, you know, not saying it has to be one individual, but finding those other groups or individuals who are kind of saying the same thing, kind of going, who's going to do this? Who's going to mm -hmm. make this happen? Say, hey, don't you think maybe we could all come together and, and make this happen? And, um, uh, you know, makes the job a lot easier if there's more of you yeah. <laughs> doing it. So, yeah. So, so, that, so that begs the question, what, is, what are the recurring themes for you that you keep hearing over and over? Where, wouldn't it be yeah. great if, wouldn't it be great if yeah. you know, these are potential acts and yeah. know, things that we could potentially take up? So it's a dangerous question to ask a creative, <laughs> as we but talked you hear about. Certain things in yes. the first refrain. Yeah. Um, so the big one that we heard when I initially um, started, you know, when I made this really kind of gawky, awkward shift from "Hey, I'm one of the makers" to 
rents due. Um, right. That was a really, it was a strange transition. Um, but as soon as I did that, my ears were also open to, okay, I've been hearing my friends who are working in the fire arts saying, my building just got sold or the zoning changed. So ceramic artists were kind of the first group that we heard a lot of people saying, I don't, I lost my studio. I, I can't have my kill in the basement of my apartment anymore, which actually kind of makes sense. Um, and um, so that's when we built out the um, Bayside Clay Center. So we um, really consolidated that group of people who were kind of making the most noise about losing their space. That and also jewelers, um, metal workers. So we also made sure that we could accommodate um, those. We don't have a collective metalworking studio, but we have the ability to um, serve uh, metal workers on a small scale, not welding and such, but um, jewelers particularly. And so those were really some of the first kind of big things um, that we heard. And you know, we filled up our ceramic studio within the first three months, you know, went from two to 20 um, in three months. So that was, you know, a clear, okay, that was yeah. what we were hearing was true. <laughs> um, and that's actually our fastest growing group is the ceramic and fire artists. Um, but to that extent, like I said, um, I'm not just wishing there'd be glass studio. I do hear glass artists. I, I get calls, um, you know, I'm, I'm moving up from Florida. I had a studio in New Hampshire. It, do you know of any, um, you know, buildings, even just, you know, do you know of any buildings? Do you know of anybody with a glory hole? Um, so I hear a lot of that. Um, woodworkers, um, a lot of furniture makers um, who need a thousand square feet that's affordable, and that's the trick. Um, I've been working with um, one of our, um, actually as a volunteer, um, we were trying to do something in-house um, at a level which really, coming back to that scale issue, just wasn't going to work inside of the scale that we have going on at Running With Scissors. Um, and so I'm working with him trying to find a place locally where Running With Scissors could be a kind of um, partner in it, uh, more of a supporting partner, uh, but it would also have some reciprocation with um, the woodworking studio that would be at a more um, upgraded level, but really finding a location that you can have that kind of square footage, an industrial setting that isn't being, um, I mean, the rates that I've been seeing are pretty daunting for anything, you know, within a radius of the people that we're hearing. So I'm hearing a lot of, you know, well, it, it urban living. Yeah, yeah. Like affordable housing. Yeah. If you're going to be on the yeah. peninsula or anywhere near it. Yeah. And so I suppose, because that sounds like a, a bunch of different groups of people with really specific needs that yeah. have the same baseline, yeah. which is affordable space. Yeah. And so what would advocacy for something like that look like? Because that seems like, you know, we at the Mechanics Hall, we mm -hmm. probably can't rent out right. square footage to, you know, the glass artists <laughs> yet. As far as I know, yeah. Look, yeah. I see Sam look at Tom. I don't yeah. know. Is there something in the works? Well, Can you put something uh, in the basement? It, I mean, it's, a, it's a thing that Tom has been talking about for a while. Yeah. And an idea that we've been trying to advocate for. And, yeah. You know, to, to sort of very, it's difficult. And it's yeah. difficult to convince the powers that be and people to subsidize things like that when yeah. you could rent it out bad market rate for money. Yeah. And so I suppose that raises an issue, like it's one thing for an organization like ours to, just, to think, well, okay, our pressure point would be to, to take on a space and, and be the subsidizer, but something else would be mm -hmm. maybe more in line with the education element that you're talking about. And so maybe yeah. that's the question. How, do, how, do, how would people in need of creative spaces all over Portland come together and what would they say? What would that unified voice say? Yeah. How would that voice be saying it. Yeah. Um, I think it, and you know very well <laughs> how difficult it is to pull together a, I mean, to pull together a self-sustaining in a way, even subsidized, there has to be a way to 
make it sustainable in our current um, community in the <coughs> parameters that um, we have and and I say that kind of in a way that Maine and Portland are wonderful um, we have this incredible group of creative people of you know people who want to be who are here for a reason but we also are you know somewhat isolated in our northern northeastern geogra geographical position um, our population isn't um, always I, I just don't know if it's necessarily always there to support things in the way that we want them to be supported in I think <coughs> it could be but I, I I wonder about that I feel like I go down that path and I find that's where I hit my head on the ceiling is you know when you kind of quantify it out can this be supported in this way now I have talked to I that being said I've, I've thought about that in the more traditional sense of you know um, a nonprofit um, subsidized maybe by the city or something like that um, but I think there's a lot of interesting models um, that are occurring in in communities similar that um, are more of that community purchasing the coming together of again not waiting for someone else to do it but really <coughs> figuring out a uh, outside the box way to own what we want to see happen um, for a while I was looking at some creative real estate um, you know options with different people who are interested in those things but it, it takes a lot of organizing getting people to be on the same page and have the same interests and have the patience to have it um, matriculate in the way that you know slow moving large projects do and um, patience is is hard in our rapid paced <laughs> world these days um, you know so I think that I don't know I wonder if it isn't more um, these smaller entities coming together um, being independent but being in a collective together mm -hmm. so there's skin in the game there's um, a communal interest but the burden isn't on one overseeing yeah. group or subsidy or you know grant because you never know who's going to be in charge of the um, the grants or the laws or whatever the amount that's going to get released to creative groups and that might last for five years and then it's gone right. and then you're you know have that challenge so I, I think I about the public market house yep. versus the public market yeah right, those two great examples you know this yeah. one very yeah. real very realistic the businesses who are there are making yeah. work in a, in a very real way versus the sort of government run version that was grandiose right. and far too and bit off yes. far too much than it could chew and, yeah. and, and fundamentally didn't work yeah. financially. And I think that there are ways, um, I mean before we were in the building that we're currently in, there was a project that I was working on where I had that more encompassed um, kind of hive of running with scissors is this part, this um, studio element, but then let's have three or four other entities that are, um, you know, in more industrial, more um, food production, you know, just that could work really well together and be supportive and also need that kind of space and then have a communal um, center and store and everything. And it was, it was really tricky and we were very close, but I, I find that it can happen even in a neighborhood like East Bayside and it can happen in a bigger way as long as there's this kind of underlying idea. It, it can't, it's harder with the um, things like you know bringing a glass studio together and a, wood, a large wood studio. But I think that um, I think there's a lot of buzz about that happening and I think you know, it'd be great to figure out ways to say, oh, you're working on this, I know you're doing this, hey, I know this other person's doing this, what if you guys looked at space together and, you know, tried to figure out a way to do that, but again, everyone's path happens at a different speed, so one group might be really fast on their track and the other group might be slower, and how can you get them to kind of 
come up together. Is it coming um, from top? Just for your information, there is yeah. some discussion that's, that's advancing fairly quickly about converting the general store oh, good. from public works yep. into an apprentice training facility. Oh, um, awesome. You know, that's uh, 36,000 foot yeah. footprint with another 6,000. Yeah. But that involves uh, the unions who uh, fortunately okay. have money. Yeah, yeah. And so that's that's uh, kind of advancing at this point. But the question is, is yeah. the, the remaining four acres yeah. that I would like to, uh, I'd like to see converted into an economic development zone, mm -hmm. but also those thousand square foot manufacturing spaces yeah. that are impossible to find in Portland. So. There, yeah, a thousand to two thousand square feet at an affordable rate is highly coveted by either a small production or you know a, a new business and they're 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 very very difficult if not impossible to find and so that would be that would be really exciting um, oh yeah can I ask some non space related questions I'm thinking selfishly about this organization and we're not going to solve the space issues for the makers yeah. movement in this building. Mm -hmm. But what could this organization do mm -hmm. that had to do with promotion or had to do with bringing mm -hmm. people together so they met each other? You talked about making yeah. these connections or what could we do about training in certain areas? Yeah. So you have people who have... Uh, yeah. are artists of one sort or another and they've come together and all of a sudden they have to run a business and they're like, mm -hmm. do what? And how, <laughs> how can, yeah. is there a training piece there that would be useful? What yeah. are the various things, you know, we've sort of got the organization, mm -hmm. we've, we have a mission, yeah. uh, but we, need, we don't really know clearly what those needs are that we could actually be fulfilling. Yeah, I think you really touched on something that is is so important is um, just going out and and really connecting with people and finding people in a way that's you know direct and not through the internet right because if you're mm -hmm. somebody who's looking to you know be an apprentice or be um, work with somebody else and you're also on the other side you're that small business um, or creator, you may not know what avenue, how to find that other person. And, and we so often just go, we think that this is the only way to find someone. And you know, more often than not, the people who really need help from the person who might just be down the street, um, they aren't putting that anywhere or anywhere that both of them know where to go to find it. So I think... Um, it might be really interesting. I mean, this is really lovely just to sit down and talk about things. What a novel idea. Um, yeah. Wow. Um, but really to have um, that kind of forum where, you know, you are reaching out to <coughs> the group of people who um, want to want to learn, want to be of assistance, and then those who really need help. And I know it's tricky because a lot of those people who are needing the help are often so like this that they can't even see that there's someone just over here going, I know how to help you. Just come to this thing and you're going to meet all these people who can help you. Um, so I, I think, again, that's one of the roles where I see myself um, a little bit like a mother hen, I'm always with my artist saying, hey, did you know, did you know, did you know, there's this, there's this thing you can go to. And, you know, more often than not, they're like, could you just stop talking to me? Um, I'm trying to work. I'm trying to work. <laughs> like, I know, but I know somebody could help you work smarter and not as hard. Um, you know, I also need to take my own advice. But um, I think that finding those connectors, I know Two Degrees of Portland does a really good job at connecting certain groups, but I think that there might be groups that need to be reached out to to say, hey, we would love to connect you with, um, you know, these other tradespeople. Uh, when, I, so when I did the traditional Japanese apprenticeship, um, I really kind of, I, I really wasn't going to go back to ceramics, but this man was so compelling, I thought I have to work in the studio, regardless of what it does to me. <laughs> um, 
But um, I had never considered an apprenticeship in this day and age, you know, as at this traditional, very traditional sense of, you know, a certain length of time that you're with someone and you're mastering these certain skills and going up this kind of progression. Um, I think there, there would be a lot of interest in that and I think there would be a lot of people who would be amazed to find out how much somebody who's interested in, in learning those skills, um, you know, can enrich their own business and their own creative path. So I guess it doesn't really give you an answer, but just that, that really trying to connect in a face-to-face -face, um, way I think is really powerful. Directories are great, you know, <laughs> lists of people are great, but somehow trying to bring people just in front of each other, mm -hmm. and I know that's, as we were saying, mm -hmm. it's really hard when there's a million fascinating <laughs> things in Portland to do every night um, to choose, yes, I'm going to go out on a limb and do this, but I think, you know, to your point of, of organizing the makers, um, I think the more organizing we can do and supporting each other on those paths, the more likely connections are going to happen and the more likely, you know, it's that grassroots community organizing, we need to, you know, just get right back to that. Um, um, Technology is great for, you know, your calendar and all kinds of things, but nothing beats just meeting face to face. Face to face. Thank you. This is really fun.